Well, welcome, everybody. We like to start on time, you know what I'm saying? So it doesn't matter who's here, who's not, who's rolling in. We're going to just welcome Jesus into this place. So if you want to um, stand up, I want to invite the kids up. And um, any kid that wants to <laughs> worship. <laughs> um, that's it, yeah. My kids know. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Well, welcome. It's going to be a good few days. We're still registering and parking people, but we're going to invite Jesus in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We just um, we humble ourselves under your hand. We humble ourselves under your hand, Lord. And we're here for you. Thank you, Jesus. We just seat you at the highest place right now. We might have been stressed out driving down the freeway, crazy Christmas time. But we just put all that aside right now. And we just invite you to come in. <laughs> come on, let's just draw on him already. We don't need to wait till the fourth or fifth song. Let's just, let's just jump into his presence right now. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. <laughs> We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. <laughs> we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, fresh. Let the miracles flow right now, even before we worship. Man, I just feel his presence. <laughs> I don't know about you, sometimes I just laugh. <laughs> flow, flow, flow down. Come on, Lord, just let your ease fill this room. Put us under your rest. Put us under arrest right now. <laughs> oh, we just make space. We make room. We make it. We don't wait for the room to happen. We make way for the Lord right now. Whew. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I'm just giving him a minute. I'm stalling. I, I really am. I'm just giving him a minute. Come in, Lord. Can we just say, come in, Lord. 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 Can we just sing that?
Sing your praise aloud. Sing your praise aloud. Awake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. I won't stop singing.
Sometimes I gotta tell myself to praise him. And that's okay.
Worship takes us places into His presence, but also changes the place that we stand in. Worship takes us places into His presence, but it also changes the place that we're standing in. It shifts the atmosphere that we're in. My little boy ran up to me during worship and he's like, Daddy, Daddy. He said, while I was worshiping, a wind blew on the back of my neck, on your back. He said, I looked around, there was nothing behind me. (laughs) 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 If you're you're skeptical, you're going to probably say, well, that's just the fan. (laughs) (laughs) But when we worship, the fabric between his world and ours gets real thin. shifts atmospheres we start to hear him and see him and experience his world where the things of this world start to get less important the schedules, the holidays the stress, the drama, the lawsuits the in-laws, the outlaws all of it just starts shifting I'll take a breath on the back of my back over all that stuff because I understand it's more than just a wind. It's a spirit. It's the spirit. And I understand that in a place where I can shift everything and just find Him in a moment. Miracles that maybe I've never even thought were possible are possible. Pearls that drop out in a message can shift my whole mindset and change my life not because I'm here for anybody or anything or an experience it's but because I'm in a moment I'm finding you Jesus and I've just stopped the whole world and it doesn't really matter who's here anymore it's just you and me and I just need your breath on my face Jesus Father I just came I just came for fresh breath because when you breathed into that mud that looked like a man that man became a living spirit I need that same breath to on my face because I understand you can shift everything and I'm here tonight, not because it's another meeting or a whatever conference. I'm here in pursuit of my friend, my lover, my king, because I know everything shifts when I find you. But really you're finding me. That's really what's happening is you're finding me. And I just need to be found tonight, God. I need you to find this room tonight, God, and shift things in us and drop things in us and break things off us, God. Would you come? We're laser focused to find your heart and we're just putting everything aside tonight because you are more important than life. You're important, more important than anything going on around us. You're the lover of our soul, God, and we wanna learn how to love you the way we need to. Come, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we release you. Just do whatever. We, we just take the keys off. We take the chains off. Whatever you're used to in church, just let it go because Jesus made messes of people's ideas all the time. Why don't we just put that aside tonight? Whatever your culture is and church or whatever you're used to or your little stiff neck religion, just put that to the side for a minute. Let's just find Jesus and let Him come and shift everything tonight. Can we do that? (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. We just worship you, Father.
Sometimes we know how to come into his courts with praise and thanksgiving, but we don't know what to do when we get there. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a transaction he's wanting to have with us tonight. I don't think we should come into his presence and come out unchanged. If a, if a potter puts his finger in clay and he takes his finger away and the clay looks the same as it did before, then did he ever touch the, the clay? I want us to be touched tonight. How about you? I want Jesus to touch us. I want Jesus to mark us. I want His words to penetrate our hearts and shift some things deep down. Maybe some broken things in the foundations of what we've been living that we didn't even realize were wrong. God, shift us tonight. Mark us tonight, God. Set us on fire tonight. Pour out your goodness in us tonight, Jesus. <laughs> Whew. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I just want to welcome you tonight. I'm, I'm already a little bit wrecked, a lot wrecked. And I just want Jesus to do whatever He wants. But we're going to go through a couple of things and I'm going to introduce our very special, honoured friend, Father, man of God, woman of God, model that we can follow. So why don't you just grab a seat for a second and Hug someone near you, say hi. Tell them that they're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Okay, where are we? Thank you, Jesus. Just real quick. My name's Andrew. That's my wife, Rebecca. And, and we, lead, we lead this house here called Commission. And we're just chasing Jesus. It's about probably all I can say to you about that. We're chasing Jesus the best we can. We have prayer nights here on Wednesday nights. We've got that up on the screen. We've got prayer nights here at uh, 7.30. We come in here and we go after heaven. There's no point in having church if you're not praying. Because prayer is the engine house of, of the kingdom, not just the franchise. Of the kingdom, and so if you've got nothing to do on Wednesday night and, and you're looking for more of God, why don't you show up here and pray with us? That's a good thing. And then we do gathering nights once a month. We just do this. We just go after heaven. I feel like that's what you're supposed to do: is just keep going after heaven. <laughs> okay. So you're welcome to come to that if you'd like, and if not, we still love you. Okay. So we're going to give to the Lord right now. Is that all right? We're going to give to the Lord, and I just want to, every time Brother David and Mrs. Hogan come in, we always bless them with everything that comes in, so you don't need to look, us, look at us with an evil eye. Sorry that you got hurt somewhere, but we're not here for money, we're here for Jesus. But He has given us money to steward, and so we're not ashamed to talk about it. And so what we want to do tonight is we ultimately are giving to heaven, but we want to bless the one that's bringing the message tonight. Is that all right? Yeah. And I understand it's Christmas. I understand you spend all your money at Walmart, Amazon. Some of you are last minuting it right now during worship probably. I don't know. Hopefully not. <laughs> but, but I want to say this. When I find good ground, I want to get all the seed I can into that ground. And I want to honor heaven in that ground. And this is some of the best. This is the best ground we've found personally. And so I would encourage you, don't get cheap. Don't get stingy. I understand some of us are blowing our budgets out. I understand that with presents. But a present that can break two days later is not going to get you the same harvest as a seed that goes into the kingdom. That's just not the same thing. And so I would encourage you, let's get generous. We're going to sow tonight. So if you want to, if you want to give while I'm getting ready to... Read the scripture, I believe there's, is the envelopes on the backs of the chairs? Is that right? Um, otherwise, there's instructions that you can give up on the screen. Everything we get, we'll go to uh, Freedom Ministries, David Hogan, Mrs. Hogan. Matthew 25, I'm going to read from verse 34. Then the king, that's, that's the king, not a king, the king, our king, will say to those at his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now listen to this. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me, and I was sick, and you visited me, and I was in prison, and you came to me. What that means is I need to find Jesus and other people, and I need to be generous to God and other people. Because there's something here that's telling us a future tense of all of our lives that we're going to stand before a king and he's going to say, when I had need, you gave, you came, you sowed. So with that tonight, why don't you ask Holy Spirit, what would you like me to sow to Freedom Ministries? Now we're going to, we're going to, you can give it one of three different ways. So you can text it, you can go on the website, or you can, um, you can uh, put, a, put something in the envelope, and we're going to get it all to them. But there's this other little scripture that I like. It says, receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, and you'll get a prophet's reward. Now, it's not that you can buy what he's carrying. I don't want to suggest that, because that comes with a lot of blood, sweat, tears, pain. But you can get a reward. And I want to sow into that tonight. And I would encourage you to. We're going to pray real quick. Is that right? Father, we just thank you that we have an opportunity to be generous to one of your sons that's been faithful and is a messenger in the earth. And that we get to be generous now. We get to not just be generous to him, but we, we get to extend to you part of our gratitude and what really you're owed from us in reality. And we ask, God, that you would receive it and that you would compound it into their hands and that you would bless them and that you would cause our seed to grow and that reward to be abounding to everyone. Father, we bless you for tonight. We just ask you to move, to speak, to unshackle things and to sow seed into our, into our lives tonight as we're listening, as we're experiencing, as we're getting lost in your presence. And I ask God right now in your atmosphere in your throne room, that you would receive our giving tonight and that you would bless our giving in Jesus' name. Whew. Amen. Amen. I think that is all I got to say. Oh, we need a, if you've got an envelope, please raise it up. Some of our awesome people come and collect that. But other than that, I would like to welcome up in just a second here so we don't get lost. Brother David Hogan, Mrs. Debbie Hogan, very special friends of ours. More importantly, very special friends of Jesus. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So, how y'all good? <clears throat> I might not want to put that on your piano. Here, bring me that, that little white thing or something. Put this deal on it. Yeah, y'all can bring your junk up there to be prayed for. We still do that. Holy Ghost. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, maybe Debbie, I'll put the, I'll put them things up there. Holy Ghost. One, two, three over the coconut tree. Everybody can hear me or? All righty. Thank you all. Uh, <clears throat> so while this is going on, I want to, because uh, it's been brought to my attention that I'm very offensive. <laughs> and uh, I want to apologize to you if I've offended you. Uh, I do mean that, actually. Because uh, I'm... Uh, but I'm not going to back away from being offensive. Uh, <laughs> so what y'all got to deal with is, is Jesus has touched us again. We have a fresh touch of heaven on us. It's not stale bread. It's brand new bread. Uh, uh me personally, I don't eat leftovers. My wife cooks me fresh meals. Uh, so if you're a person that likes leftovers, uh, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> I don't do that. 
so you got it sorted, do you? Okay. All righty. That's nice. This is nice. We've got a job ahead of us, Mom. That's good. You all right? But I do want to apologize to you, on, uh, and for real, uh, if you have been offended. Uh, because you're offended, I'm offended, so there you are. So that's all I'm going to say about that. So fortunately, Mrs. Hogan is still with me. Thank you, mujer. Thank you, Paca. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> her and I have completed 52 years of marriage. Yeah. And uh, that's together, together with each other. And uh, it's been very bumpy at times, and I attribute that to her. That little face is turning red. That's all right. That's all right. And so I just I just want y'all to understand that we love each other, this lady and I. And that it's doable. So is that a feather or is that somebody's fur? <laughs> so I just I just want y'all to know that we we're having a good time, her and I. And it's not a fake deal. It's we're enjoying each other, and and our we're getting older now, and it's pretty nice to be. Both of us are healthy. Yeah. So, want to say something? Nothing. Te amo, mommy. Yeah. Okay. So, I haven't been out here in a while. Um, And it's not because I don't like California, um, but I, I ain't lost very much out here, I can tell you that. I'm happy for you that you found something out here. I bless you in it. Because I'm from Mexico. I was born in the United States in Louisiana, but I spent the last 48 years. That thing, what is that thing? You don't see that? It landed right on your leg there. Your leg, English, right there, yeah. And um, we've spent the last lots of years in Mexico, and and mostly good. Uh, God's taught us how to seek Him. He's taught us how to raise the dead. Uh, I'm currently active dead raiser. Um, we had one happen just a few months ago uh, when I was home. Um, I wasn't there. But the, but the goal that we're doing with this gospel is to make disciples. That's the goal. And that they become better than you are in the endeavor of the gospel. That's the goal. That's my goal. Yeah, and I have studied this thing extensively, and I know it's what God wants. All right, so let me tell you her story, because we had this pretty big conference, and 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 this this uh, these Indian uh, they don't have uh, running water and lights on it, dirt floors, and so they're back in time according to y'all's timetable, uh, and so. This girl was born into this family, and the dad is one of our pastors. We've been working together for a number of years, 20-something years. He's a good man, if there is such a thing. Uh, his marriage is good. His kids are good. They love Jesus. But then one of his daughters falls sick. You see, that don't compute to y'all's modern theologies 
how can you how can thing how can you be serving God with, with a whole heart and you're relatively a good person your marriage is good your kids are good and God's blessing your crops and your finances are growing but then how can sickness then find its way into your home when clearly the Bible says it won't come nigh your dwelling the Bible says it in those words Okay, so this is a dilemma that people are trying to solve, and they're diluting the Word of God. I'm not going to even try to attempt to answer that question. I do not have an answer for that. What I have is a God that's in control, and He's large. Uh, He can fix stuff that we can't. Um. And so this young girl gets sick. And so we go into the battle of trying to get her healed. Uh, Every one of you in here that loves Jesus more than today have been in this battle. And you've lost. You've lost people that are dear to you. So have I. And I'm not going to make any excuses. Jesus is king. Flat, that's the end of the story. Bam. All right, but how do you reconcile a pastor that loves Jesus, he's winning souls, his, his family's dear to him, he's not, he's not a bad guy as far as, that, uh, as, we, as we judge. But yet his daughter gets sick, they carry her to the doctor, they don't have any money, he says there ain't nothing we can do, the disease is too far advanced, uh, some type of cancer. And so... They bring her home, and they're, they're, they're fasting and praying and crying, and, and they lost. One, one night, the, one of the sons goes to the toilet. It's outside, of course. And he finds his sister laying in the dirt. So the price of doing right is you lose your daughter. All right, now that's not an explainable deal for me. I can't explain that to you. Uh, But I can ask you, let's keep walking together, please. Horrible as life really is, don't listen to people that think they have the answers. They're lying to you. Jesus is king, and he deserves our trust. Whether you can understand it, see it, figure it out, it's not relevant. What's relevant is who he is. Uh... And so they bring her in. Now, this is an amazing. Uh, she was at this big deal we was doing. And she come up to me. I mean, she's the most humble. You ought to see her. She just, she, her head is down. She walks up to me like this. Brother David, Jesus raised me from the dead. Can I please tell the people about it? And I'm just looking at her. Sure. Uh, it, look, they brought this girl. This this is a dad. He loves this baby. You, you know that. Ladies, y'all get it. Y'all, moms. He brings that baby in there, clears the table. And it's not like y'all's table. It's dirt floor and a little bitty uh, pine thing. Lays her on the table. She's dead. And... Uh, they pray for a few hours. Nothing happens. So he says to the family, keep praying. So he goes out. We have, Our churches are, uh, it could be anywhere from uh, a mile to two or three miles between these villages. And so he goes around, gathers up this whole horde of uh, elders from other churches, brings them in there. And now the house is full of outsides, you know, because they're well-liked people. Um, they're trying to do a good job, and so that brings uh, people to you to help in time with this in this kind of scenario. So they started praying. Now it's like seven hours or something, then eight, and then nine, and then ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, and then a little girl sits up on the table, and she's not a little girl; she's she's a young woman, and. Uh, she, of course, she had seen Jesus. She had talked with Jesus. She's got all these words and all this stuff. <coughs> and the devil, the disease, let me go back over that. 
The devil, the disease that killed her is gone. Jesus took it. And he raised her from the dead. I don't have an explanation why that works either. I cannot predict it. I cannot tell you when it's going to happen. I cannot forecast. Uh, I cannot. All I can walk is in is intimidation from the power of a mighty God. He is amazing. That's all I can say to you. You're going you're to find me different this time than you've ever seen me, the ones you have, uh, because I just got myself gutted. Uh, if you understand that term, I'm a hunter. Uh, and you gut animals, field dress them in the woods, you know. And so hell came and gutted me and my wife. Tried to kill us. Still, uh, tried to steal a, long, a lifelong work from us. But they were unsuccessful. Um, okay, so, so. You would expect me to be angry. To, I'm not now. I'm not. I was last year. I'm not this year. Uh, so I'm going to tell you how I handled it. It's different than what you'd probably do. I don't drink and I don't do drugs and I don't uh, do other women. Uh, I don't do those things. I don't do that. I do Jesus. And when everything turns against me, Fortunate for me, I have been, I, my, my reflexes and my, my submission and my faithfulness and my diligence has been at the feet of Jesus. So when everything turns against you, fortunately, that's where you go first. And that's where you stay. And so that's what we did. Now, you're not, this is where I'm going to lose you because everybody lives life just like we do and everybody's been gutted in here. If you've lived life for any time, you've come across something you couldn't fix and it ran right over the top of you. All right, so. What we decided to do, my wife and I, because it doesn't include anybody, you're going to find out the longer you live, I've outlived my enemies, most of them. I've outlived my friends. I've outlived my mentors. <laughs> and, and so here I am out here now walking through life with no forecast. <laughs> and so what we did, I told her, because the way it went, I'll be real short about this because I want to get to something else. What we did is uh, I went, as soon as I heard about the dilemma, and it was serious, uh, I went, hid myself, and turned my Bible on and cut my lights off, and I'm just sitting in there trying to, trying to get, trying, trying to not be who I am but let Jesus be who he is. Because who I am, you're not going to like. Because I'm a gun-toting redneck from Louisiana. You ain't going to like that guy. But the, the Jesus in me that has rearranged my lifestyle to him needs to be in control at this point in my life. This is the most dangerous path I've ever been on. Because I'm, I'm more responsible than I've ever been. Thousands of churches, hundreds of thousands of people are, are looking to my wife and I for the right guidance. So I, uh, hell wants me to make bad decisions and wreck all these people's lives. Jesus wants me to bow to him and make good decisions. So that's the fight. That's the war. It's uh, what it's always been. It's what it always will be, seems like. So I'm sitting in there, and my wife couldn't find me, and that makes her nervous because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, in the daylight, I'm up and at them, buddy. Doop. Finally, she found me in there, and I'm, I'm sitting in the dark, and I'm with the Bible's going. So her, her world knows 
that there's a calamity. And she comes sit down and begged me for what it is. So I told her. I told her what I thought we was going to have to pay to fix it. And she said, I don't know if I can pay that. We've, we've paid so much, David. I said, I understand that. I'm not asking you. I wouldn't ask you that. This is our boss asking. That's a different game. I need you to understand something. My love for her is complete. My love for Jesus supersedes that. There's the end of the story. So, uh, she said, I'm going to need a couple of days to think about it. I said, take all your time you want. But you see me sitting in here, I'm making, my mind's made up. I just got to, I've got to figure out what's the right first step. Because if you're off a, a one degree, the first year or two, you're not very far away from the truth. But if you get down there five or ten years, you're quite a ways away. So you have to make good decisions, is what I'm telling you. And under stress, that's hard to do. And, and so uh, I was under pretty good stress here. So I, want, I just want to compliment my wife. I don't, even, I don't know how to give her a higher compliment than what I'm fixing to give her right now. Because she's awesome to me. After all these years, I find her awesome to me. And all of a sudden, it's like the fifth day or something, fourth, I don't remember, one of them days, of me sitting in a chair listening to the Bible and not eating or drinking anything. I'm just sitting there waiting on God to come in and show me which direction, what, what's the degree, I, what, where I need to be on the compass. Because that's the line I'm going to walk. I'm not, I don't matter. What you say is not going to affect me. What Jesus says is what affects me. And she came in, boy, y'all listen to me. I, I'm, I'm so happy with Jesus, my goodness. Because she put her hand in mine like she's done for 50-something years, 52 or 3. And she said, now, when, you, when you've been walking as long as we have together, there ain't a whole lot of talking anymore. Because a, a couple of words means like 10,000 or something. And she said these words to me. We die together. And I looked at her. Okay. That was it. That conversation was over. She went and sit in her prayer chair, and I'm sitting in mine, and we're in the dark listening to the Bible together. That's the way life's supposed to be. God was very generous with letting us be of the same mind together after all these years. That's a generous God right there. I like him, and I like her. Because she found his word, and, and, and she came and shared it with me. And, and then, because now with one, that's enough. I'm done. I don't need anybody else. I, I didn't need her. Oops. The only person I need is Jesus. But now that I get her, man, I'm in good shape. And then, door, somebody's banging on the door about day six or seven. I go open it up. It's my son, Joseph. Y'all know him. Some of you do. And his wife, and he said, I need to come talk to you, Dad. I said, dude, I'm not in the mood. Uh, he said, well, I know, but you probably won't be for a while, so I need to talk to you anyway. I said, okay, deal. So he come in there, and he said, I ain't looking right in the face. He said, we have been fasting and praying as well, and my wife and I commit to you and Mom, period. So, so here I ended up. Alone for, you know, a few days. Next thing you know, I got a whole team going here. And then we went out and work, and, of course, it got better and better and better from then on. And then Jesus came, y'all, and just dumped awesomeness on us. And in the middle of it is this little girl getting raised from the dead. Okay, and, okay, so hell's goal was to gut us and leave us laying in our own blood right there, right? And it was the plan. Let me, say, let me suggest to you 
that there, there are powers smarter than you. And I know you don't like them kind of suggestions. But I have to tell you how merciful your God is. Because he came, he came right in the middle of that bad scenario. And he just, now look, I, it took, okay, the little girl gets raised from the dead, then there's all these demon possessions happening and they're getting healed. And all of a sudden there's an outbreak of mercy in the middle of the war. It matters. The first step you take matters to heaven. You ain't got to go 10 years of proving something to God. You got to make your mind up and your heart has to follow that and you have to walk toward heaven. And then mercy falls. So, so. There, there's no describing to you. Uh, there's been... I spent the whole month of July zigzagging through all of Mexico from Guatemala to the United States, zigzagging 5,000-something miles, going and talking to elders and groups of churches that were uh, lost or left behind in the COVID deal. And they, they, and they want the fire. They want the Holy Ghost. They want mercy. And we picked up, in, in the month of July alone, we picked up like 360 churches. I don't know if you understand what I just said to you. Probably don't. Este, Debbie, abre eso, por favor. Necesito agua. Gracias, amable. Okay. So, the first whole year of uh, being befuddled, being confused, uh, how could this happen? Uh, we are stable. We are not unstable people. We make good decisions. We have not made bad decisions. There's no, as far as being a human, y'all would think we was good. But I compare myself to Jesus, so I, I don't ever see myself as awesome. Uh, I see myself as needy. That's how I view me. I need Jesus. Uh, so, so, what's happened is the power of God has come at such a rate that I don't have anything to compare it to. Uh, the the, the uh, so many people's getting saved. I I was trying to explain to them yesterday when we got here. I was, I was trying to explain to them. I don't have nothing to compare this to because every time, uh, every time I look around, uh, uh, people are falling out and quitting and so forth. But instead of quitting, we, we did something that's going to really, there's, there's a few things I'm going to say right now that's going to really bother you. And I'm going to say it on purpose because I want you bothered. When this, when this thing really set in and gripped us, and I can't cry anymore, and I can't be any more angry. I run out of, I run at the end of all the emotions. So what do you do after that? It matters. So what I did is I told my wife, I'll be seeking Jesus now. And so I started getting up every day, and I did it for a solid year without a miss, without a miss. So I'm a diligent human. I got up every day at 3.30 in the morning. By 4 o'clock, I was on my face worshiping God with no time limit. And I, you say, well, I got to work. Well, you ain't the only one. You're not special. <laughs> All of us have to work or we don't get to eat. So, but you can give God the glory you can bow to him instead of being frustrated and angry. And you can sit in, in his presence on your face indefinitely 
even though you do have to work. It's a matter of some discipline. It, it matters what you're looking for and what your goals are. When, when I have found out, most people don't even have goals. They're just going with that flow out there on that interstate. And it's going wrong. It's headed the wrong direction. Jesus is king. So, now, by doing this, because I'm not a new guy, I'm a veteran. I've been doing this for years, decades, and getting good results. But this is different. Something came. There, we've been touched with this fresh anointing. Because during this time of seeking God, what we got to do was the angels came and brought this new medal. Heaven sent me a new medal. I don't know what it is yet. I don't know how to use it yet. But me and the angels beat this medal out. I stayed with it. And we, we forged this armor. And they fitted me with it. And somehow I found health in there. I, I, wasn't, I didn't know to look for help. But I'm, look at me, I'm healthy. I'm 72, and I want you to look. <laughs> 13 days ago, tomorrow will be two weeks, I ran my 60th marathon. I did. Tomorrow is two weeks since I did it. And I did it up there at Reading at the, at the, on that uh, Sacramento y'all's river thing that goes up to the dam from Reading. And I was out there by myself. There was a few animals out there, a few mule deer and a couple of bald eagles and some other varmints. It was, it was cold. And I got out there and got, my, got me 30 miles, did me an ultra, and I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I'm healthy. And uh, my wife's healthy, and I want to encourage you that uh, if you will bow, you will find. If you're a complainer and an entitled human, you're not going to find anything but more problems. But you can be fixed. God will fix you. He'll send angels with this metal. I don't even know what to say to you because I'm, I'm wanting to war. I'm a fighter. I want to do battle with this thing's trying to kill us. I want that fight. And I get this new equipment, and I'm standing there, and I got, I got my shield up and my sword in my hand, and I'm, and I'm ready, finally, after all this time, all these hours and hours and hours and hours of forging this metal. And that wind, it hit that boy a while ago. I'm standing there on the battlefield in these ranks of enemy. There, there's, God, there's a lot of, it was awesome. It was the best. I'm a trapper hunter. That was, they trapped me. It took them seven years to plan that trap, and they got me. All right. And so I got my hand on my thing, and I'm fixing to step into battle. I got the new equipment. I got the angels. I'm ready. Yeah. And then the wind blew by me. Blew me in circles. <laughs> and I, by the time I get back, the enemy are falling. And I, there ain't nothing. You can't see a thing. They're just being wiped out. I must encourage you to trust Jesus. It's impossible what happened. It is. There's no logic. There's no reason. There's no. It's bizarre. It's like, why did we go through the whole drama when you could have done that? <laughs> I got I got questions about this stuff. That there ain't very, there ain't no answers to some of it. Uh, you think you got questions? 
okay, so why would you make the little girl suffer with all this stuff if you're going to raise her from a dead and heal her? I don't understand none of that. Fortunately, he's the boss, and I'm not. Fortunately. So now, I've got like, there's these four or five chapters, six maybe, that have stuck to me during this forging of the metal. And, and I'm going to pick one of them and just talk. It's probably going to be an axe because that one there, I like that one. It helps me the most. Well, I don't know. They all help. They all help. Y el agua, ¿qué pasó? Mujer, hombre. Tráeme el agua, güey. Gracias. Yeah. Where am I? No, no, no. Eso. Gracias, hermana. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what's in that black thing? Oh, it's tea. Hmm. Man, y'all, y'all own it, ain't you? <sighs> did you, did you find Molly? Where are you at? You find honey? Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay, well, I'll forgive you this time. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do probably the the Acts chapter three and four. I want you to know that my life now is awesome. I spent the last two and a half years, look at me, how thin. And it does have to do with running. It does. But it's mainly fasting and praying. I want Jesus. I don't want friendship. You'd probably be the best friend ever. But I do to have some doubt about that. Jesus is king. Listen. I really want to tell you how good it has gotten. But I can't. Because my biggest problem now is, is not running over everybody. I find it easy to disallow things, and I can't do that. My responsibility, my job, my contract I have with the Holy Ghost is I have to try to include you. I have a contract, and my boss is serious. He don't play, Jack. He don't. Your rights, which you all believe you have so much of, they don't count with him. What counts is what he wants. And so I would suggest to you to bow to that. That's a good suggestion, good counsel. Now, I, w I want you to look at this, Acts chapter 3 here. You remember, if, so, so here, here's some questions. Ready? These boys, Peter and John, are going... Does anybody know about Acts chapter 3? Who does? What's going on in Acts chapter 3? Right. That's what they said. So the rest of you don't know that? Know what's going on? No wonder y'all ain't got no miracles. You don't know what the Bible says. That's sad. Okay, so what's going on is Peter and John are going at what they considered the time of prayer. Okay, and they're going to this place to pray, right? Two of them, Peter and John. Peter is the most presumptuous, aggressive. I'm like Peter. I'm trouble. Okay, I've got that figured out. Everybody wants me to be Elijah or John, but I'm not those guys. I'm not Moses, <laughs> I'm Peter. I'll pull the sword in a heartbeat. <laughs> that, that, that's me. Okay, so, and I cause so much trouble. And, and But so much is getting done at the same time. Uh, it's hard to figure all of it out. Okay, but these two guys 
All right. You just spent, how many years were they with Jesus? How many, how many years was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half. That's a good guess. That's, that's what we have calculated. Uh, it's close to that. You're, you're, it's right. That's a proper answer. All right. So they, they just walked with the Messiah for three and a half years. Why do they have to go pray? All right. See, now, that's a, that's a question. And Jesus, the Messiah, they couldn't find him every day. Why? Because he was up way before daylight, off by some rock in some desert, praying and seeking God. Okay, well, what's up with that? And you think you can do a 30-minute deal down here and do your penance, and you're good to go. Now, something's wrong with what we're doing. It's off course. And so I'm going to try to put it back on course in perspective for you. Yeah, I am overkill. That's me. I am every day 3.30. That's me. That's me. Every day. Nothing. I ain't getting off course. You ain't going to talk me off course. I don't care about your stupid games. I like football. I don't care. I'm going to bed. I got to get up. I got to seek Jesus. He's king. Not some stupid trophy. And they're awesome to me. I like it. I like certain things. But, but it's priorities. And in my world, I'm under contract. You may not be. But I am. And I fortunately don't have to go up before creator God for you. You believe that a priest will do that for you and you've been absolved. I don't believe that at all. I believe you're going to have to stand there naked and alone. And you're going to have to make amends for yourself. Well, fortunately, I, and I'm not a works guy. I don't believe that I'm saved by my works. I believe I work because I am saved. Uh, okay, so Peter and John are going, right? Here they go, you know, every how they walk. And there's this dude sitting there. He's all bent up and crippled, whatever they look like. And, and he's been there. Guess how long he's been there? The whole time Jesus was alive, that guy was sitting by the gate. And why didn't Jesus heal him? That's another question I have. I mean, keep, you know, you can say it out loud. I'm not going to listen to you. Because I, I'm, not interested in your, I'm not really interested in your answer. I just want to raise the question. I just want to raise the question. You got to understand that you're important. It's important that you're a disciple. It's important that you, you learn from the Messiah. It's important that you carry the message that you're a good disciple and you're under contract and you do your portion of kingdom building. Whatever that is. Now, now me, I contract... I'm afraid of the contract and the guy that wrote it. That's about all I fear in life. Really, I've lost fear somewhere. It got lost in one of the mountains. I, I, I really didn't mean to go back and get it. I just never did. So I don't have much fear in me. Uh, but there is one thing I fear, and his name is God. And I'm under contract to him. And I have to, I have to. I have to obey the contract. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean? The guy by the gate, beautiful, that was crippled. Jesus was there. But it was Peter's turn to be a disciple. Well, Jesus and Peter's gone. Whose turn is it now? It's yours. Mine. Ours. Okay, so, so, now let me ask you some more questions. Now that y'all know the story we're really in. So the, the cripple guy, he's been there for 40, it says over 40 years. Later on down when they all went to court over it, it says over 40 years old, he can, he can talk for himself. Okay. Okay. So they're walking in to pray. 
That's what it says, the hour of prayer, whatever that hour is. So they're going in, and there's this dude there that's crippled, and he spoke up to them, and he said, I'm hungry. Can I have some money, please? So what they say? Silver and gold, I don't have that. But what, what did he say? What did Peter say? But what I do have, what? I'll let you have it. Now, you got to understand something. What do you have? I know. What limits are there? There aren't any. You don't count. What counts is a contract, and the guy wrote it. And he said you was everything that's impossible for you, he can do it. So you don't, you don't have an excuse. He took it from you. It's in the contract. Now, Peter reaches and gets a guy, this impetuous guy, Peter, snatches him up, whack, a crippled guy. What is his deal? A knucklehead. <laughs> but something happened. What happened? Who can tell me what happened to the crippled guy? Well, healed, yeah, that, of course. But what happened to the crippled guy? It says, your Bible does, that his feet and his ankles received strength. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. That's what your Bible says. And it scared the ever-living fire out of everybody in the temple that's holy. Because, see, the temple people are not used to notable miracles. They're used to religion. Say, yeah, that's me. Say it. That's me. Say, I've had enough. Say it. I want God's mercy in my life. I want the contract, and I want it, I want it active. Okay, y'all clear? All right. Okay. So, so then all these people come rushing because... Everybody knows the crippled guy. Everybody. And they come rushing up on Peter and him. How'd you boys do that? Now, that's where I want to take it up. I, I want you to notice that Peter didn't get a book contract from the people. Let me show you something, what he said. Verse 10, amplified okay, Brother Andrew, you all right? All right. I want, I want you to look at verse 10 of Acts chapter 3. They recognized him as the man who usually sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate. And they were filled, look what they were filled with. I want you to say this with me. I want the wonder. I want the amazement. I want the bewilderment. I want the consternation. I, I want to be filled. Freaked out because the contract worked. You hear me? All right, because what has happened to us? My wife and I. As we have aggressively sought the the feet of Jesus, because because there's there's only one thing that I personally I. I there's millions of things you should ask for, but, but I have left off asking for those things. There's one thing I want. There, and I will be successful. I won't let go. I'm way worse than any tick you ever met. You listen to me. You hear me. There, there are these sandals that John spoke about in Luke 3. It says, the sand, there's one amongst you whose sandals we are not worthy to unlatch. Okay, what I want after seeing every known miracle, every, seeing the powers of God and the goodness of God in the land of the living and watching these thousands of people get saved all over the world, 90 different nations, the miracles flowing, the contract works, 
But now I find myself after something else. I don't want those sandals. I want, I want to be laying on the floor and the king roll up in his sandals. <laughs> and, and me just looking at him. And he just touches me. If I can get that, I will feel accomplished. Say it, I want that. So I'm going to do my contract. I'm going to take it for real. I'm going to take it serious. Because I want to be in wonder. I want to. Say it. I want to be in amazement. And I want you to look what happened to this fellow, the, the healed guy. Now, while he still firmly clung to Peter, do you understand that man felt something come out of Peter's hand and it commanded that crippled demon out of him and the man got up and ran and leaped and worshipped and he come back and grabbed Peter's hand. He wouldn't let go of his hand. My Bible says he clung to Peter. That I, I know Peter's uh, like me. Uh, let, you can let go now. He hung on to Peter and John and all the people in uttermost. Say, I want utmost amazement. Say, I want that. I want that. Say it. <laughs> they crowded around him and covered the porch called Solomon's. And Peter, seeing it, answered the people, well, Why are you so surprised and wondering? See, this is supposed to be normal in our contract. It says it is. But in normal life where you live and you ignore your contract and you hate your neighbor whereas you're supposed to love him or her or them, listen to me. We have to change us, we, we. I'm not going to point at you at all, but I'm going to include you with me and make it us. We have to change. Things started happening in the last nine or ten months, I don't even, I, I, I was telling them some of this stuff. I'm not going to say it publicly. It is so controversial. The mercy of God is, has fallen upon us. These notable miracles are happening not every day. Duh, gum it close. Wow. All right. Say, I want to be in amazement and awe of my of my God and my contract. See, Peter, Peter said it right. He said, why do you keep staring at us as though by our power or piety, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our forefathers has glorified his servant, his son, Doing him honor. I need you to make your contract valid and let it come to the weight of it come upon you. The gravity, the seriousness, the, and the awe of who Jesus is. <laughs> He's amazing. You denied him, you reject him, you disown him. Say, I rebuke the denial. Say it. I rebuke rejection. Say it. I take ownership of my contract and I bow in for the mercy. And so he goes on preaching to them and talking to them and fussing at them and I was just in Norway. And this is how it went. Thank you, Brother David. You and your family. Wonderful time. We are stirred up in our faith and our spirit. We received so many positive feedbacks and reports of healing, personal meetings with God. You ready? Listen to this. This is the one I like the most. This thing right here. This right here. What I'm pleased to tell you is why I do what I do. You ready? One lady 
serious back problems. 50 years. You understand how long that is? Well, I do because I've been married to her a long time. That's a long time. And listen to me. Ready? That's how quick she was eating. And look what it says. To me, the way he worded this, this is the head pastor talking. He says, 50 years was healed physically and psychologically. Because after you suffer so long and, and you have trusted for so long and you have been denied for so long and you sit by the gate of the very temple for years, then one day a couple of knuckleheads come by. <laughs> Don't even really know. They ain't got it sorted yet, but they, they know it's right to do. They're under contract. You hear me? And you don't only get healed physically, but your body gets healed, but your mind gets healed. So the 50 years of suffering uh, gets taken. Whoosh. That right there is why we do this. Say, I want that. Say it. I want that. You do. Yes. You do. Yeah, I promise you, you do. Yes. I don't know why we were chosen. I, I don't understand that part. I don't get any much. I don't get much of it. All, all I got is lots of questions. <laughs> and they're legit. Man. I wouldn't pick me. <laughs> I know me. But God, not only did he pick me, he contracted with his son's blood for me. Now that, awesome. You hear me? Now look, I don't know what regrets you have or what mistakes you've made. If I was you, I'd let it fall off. And I'd let that contract come to bear. That's what I do if I was you. That's what I've done. Not only did we get delivered, our work got delivered, and now we're so much bigger than we. I, I just can't really tell you because it's. It'll sound like gloating and pride and everything else, which it wouldn't be, but it doesn't matter. Look at, look at verse chapter four, verse one. While Peter and John were talking, I want to tell you what your pay is for doing right and being under contract. You get to go to prison. And you get to be slapped around by the commander of the, of the military and the, and the priest. The religious world will hate you. That's what you get out of the deal. Yeah. But yeah, what you want is a book and a movie contract. <laughs> so you just got your money in piles and chests and you're so, you're so important. <laughs> Let me just go ahead and say that's not what we're doing here. Let me just go on and say, we're under contract. He gets the glory. Let me go on to co contract where you can tell you that. Is that all right? And, I, and I'm not mad at you, even though it may seem like it to some of you. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I was mad, but that's why I didn't come. Because I, can't, I cannot say this stuff. The contract forbids me to say this stuff and be angry. I have to be able to tell the truth without being angry. And it says, it says right here in verse, I want you to look at this. Uh, verse 2. I want you to look at what happens to the enemy when you validate the contract that you're under. I don't know what version you have, but tell me what your word is right there. For, uh, give me three words in that second verse of chapter 4. What does it say? Disturbed, annoyed. See, why? There's a man who had suffered so many years and he's been delivered. Everybody should be rejoicing. But the deal is religion can't allow you to get momentum. You cannot have traction. You must be destroyed and you must be unvalidated. And because they have the politics, the money, and everything else, 
They can do whatever they want and get away with it. And call it God. So I have to, I have to liberate you tonight. Religion, I'm not under contract to them. I'm under contract to the king. His name is Jesus. And it says, being in mine, it says being vexed and indignant. Could you imagine? I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I enjoy my job. I really do. I like it when religion is vexed with me. <laughs> I, I do. It makes me feel like I'm doing my contract right. Because that's what happened with Peter. And I've been in jail over and over and over again. And I, thought, I tell my wife every time I get out, don't cry for me. This is part of the contract. It happened to Peter. It happened to me. Yay. Woohoo. Move on. And see, none of you believe that. But it's such right there. But you ignore it. Because you believe in Santa Claus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. And I want you to. I want you to take your contract serious. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to care for the ones that no one else cares for. I want you to be the one that will go the mile for somebody that don't deserve it. That's what I want. All right, it says, so look what it says. The thing that got them mad was what they were preaching. What does your Bible say they were preaching? Verse 2, the last phrase. The resurrection from the dead. See, that's what I preach. That's why I'm such a controversial individual. It's because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And I don't give a flip about religion's opinion. I don't care about the, the militia. Jesus is king. Hello? And it says, so they laid their hands on him, and what happened to him? What does yours say in verse 3? What happened to those people? We put their hands on them, and what happened? They went to jail. <laughs> they went to jail. They went to jail. For fixing that guy. Boy, that ain't right. Of course it ain't. But I want you to look at verse 4. See, all of you want the numbers that's in verse 4, but you don't want the prison. Uh, so so I, don't get, I don't get your math. So Peter and John are sitting there, and they heal this fella, or Jesus did through him. If I don't say it exactly proper, I'll be scathed. And, and so, uh, honestly, they didn't have much to do with it. They were just in proximity at the right time. And the Holy Ghost wanted to do a job, he did it. You hear me? Yeah. And then they get up, and, and everybody's trying to blame them for being awesome. And they go, dude, are you serious? Jesus is awesome. He's been raised from the dead. They go, what? <laughs> and so that brings, brings the religious people around. And then, then something happens. Now, Peter and John are in jail. But look what happens in verse 4. What does it say in y'all's Bible? And that right there is what y'all call a revival. It's what Peter and John calls a bad day in jail serving God. You hear me? I'm serious. See, it's perspective. You're looking back on it because you ain't going to have to do it. But I'm looking at it. I've had to do it over and over again. And it's awful every time you do. And, and it's rats and it's feces and, it's, and nobody cares and, and they actually do but they don't even know you're in prison because they're busy following Santa's sleigh. Oops. There I go messing with y'all sacred cows. So now watch. Now watch. 
And on the following day, the magistrates and the elders and all of them, they get up, all these important people. Okay, they bring them up and they, what are you doing? Well, what power, verse 7, and what kind of authority do you do, did you do this healing? And Peter, look at verse 8. I need you to get this. He done spent some time in prison, and he's been pondering, reflecting. Okay, so what I did is I was going to pray, God likes that. And there's a sick man. I touched him. He got healed. And so my, my offering was I get to go to jail. So, so you're either going to believe in the contract by now or you're going to quit and be sad. Say the contract's valid. Say it. Valid. And it's valid for me just like it was for him true statement and Peter being filled with what that's right oh I like this Ooh, verse 9 by, by means this man was restored to health let it be known and understood by all of you in the whole house in the name and through the power say it in the name and, through the power. And, authority and authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom God raised from the dead in him and by means of him. This man is standing before you well. So I need you to put Jesus in his rightful place. And this verse right here, verse 11 says, he's the cornerstone. Now I'm fixing to get in trouble. Ready? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it voluntarily because my contract forbids me to stop here. Religion and compromise want me to hush right here. But my contract, I submit to it. Now, this is going to make some of you mad, and I'm not mad at you at all. But Jesus is the cornerstone. Not Mary, not Mohammed, not Buddha. You hear me? Not Shiva. Jesus. Jesus. You hear me? Yes. Not even Santa Claus. <laughs> I'm not mad at you. I'm not. I, 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 I do care, but then and I, I, I can't make you do anything. I'm not going to try. I'm just going to fulfill my contract. Because you deserve somebody to look you in the face. As clumsy as I am and as awkward as I am as a human. I give a flying flip about your soul. You need Jesus to touch you and your family, Amen. your neighborhoods. Amen. You, need, you need notable miracles around you. Your neighborhood needs it. They deserve it. They deserve people of contract. That's what New Testament means, a new contract. I'm right, y'all. And I want you to look at verse 13. I'm fixing to quit. They saw something in Peter and John. What did they see? Boldness. Courage. Even though they were unlearned, they were awkward. They, were, they didn't know how to approach refined people. Uh, they, they didn't know how not to offend them. They were just trying to be honest about their contract and try to help them to know that Jesus is king. <laughs> and then in verse 14, they saw the man cured standing there. What can they say? Nothing. So they ordered him out. And then, and then they said something. This is, look at verse 16. You know, I'd have been all right if I'd have stopped at verse 11. But no, I just got to keep reading to see what it says. Verse 16. This is what always happens when, a, when one of you or two of you or ten of you get touched. Actual fire of God hits you, you're home, and you get on fire for a season. Religious 
powers are under contract to shut you down. I can't let you, I can't let that happen. I got a lot of new fire on me. I got I to help you with the contract. I got to, you need to be on fire. You need to be out of control. You need to be somebody that religion just cannot figure out. You need to be this person that, look what that says right here in verse 16. I don't know what your version says, but it's, most of them say notable miracle. What do we do with these people? An extraordinary miracle has been performed. And we cannot deny it. The only way you're going to beat them is to be under contract and let these notable miracles start falling around you. What do you think happened in Norway to that lady who has been an entire generation, people taking care of her, broken back and all this stuff that's happened? All the people, the kids, the grandkids, the greats, have seen her being punished. And for some reason, Peter walks up, grabs her by the hand, feet and ankle bones, and they go, what the happened? Who are these people? Where have they been all these years? Well, what I've been doing is getting ready so I can touch her. That's what I've been doing. And the fire has come. And a good friend of mine from Germany, right, I'm done, Debbie. Tomas, por favor. Gracias, muy amable. ¿Cómo está? ¿Está bien? Gracias, amable. A good friend of mine in Germany, she's uh, she's a very important person to me. She was an awful human being, you know, and God saved her. Gave her a contract. And she's just so happy. She's, my gosh, she is, she's too happy. You know them kind of people? They're just annoying. They're so happy. And she, she's, she's a, Big old girl, strong as an ox. Every time I come driving up to their church in uh, in Germany, she opens my door, picks me out of the car, picks me up off the ground, and I'm a big old boy. And she cracks my back, Rick, and she turns me in circles. And I tell her every time, Bianca, put me down. Put me down, Bianca. Well, uh, not this, not this October, but the one before, uh, before I was over there. And Bianca didn't come to my car door. And so I asked, where's Bianca? Because, I mean, even though I make all this hoopla about, you know, her popping my back and picking me up, it's actually awesome. Because <laughs> she had such a harsh life, and God delivered that lady. And she's such a beautiful person and she's just so annoyingly happy <laughs> y'all know those kind of people of course you're not that person I hope you I hope you are it'd be awesome if you are okay so so what happens next and the guy that came you know he's German <laughs> I mean, he's, but he, you know, he's German. And he says to me, he says, you'll find out what's the matter with Bianca. And I go, can't you just tell me now? Uh, no. And so all this strictness, you know, German, you know, rules, lots of rules. And, you know, I prefer Bianca, no rules, just happy. <laughs> Crazy, Peter, happy. I like that. So, I go into the foyer, and the church is already singing in there, and there she is in a wheelchair. And I'm looking at this person so beautiful, so, so extraordinarily happy, and she's completely destroyed. Her back is broken in two places. Boom, boom. And I kneel down to her. Bianca, she, she can't move. She's 
paralyzed and she's trying. And so I go in close so she can get a hold of me. Bianca, I love you, girl. And you know what she says? She whispered right in my ear. Help me, Brother David. Now, now, if you're not under contract, you can't do nothing. Hear me? If you don't understand what the blood's all about, what the resurrection's all about, all you're going to do is have pity and emotion toward her. And that's absolutely useless. That pain that's on her is real. And it's trespassing. In my world, evil has trespassed. And how it all got that way, I do know. I'm not going to tell you. But, it, but it's horrible. She's broken. So how do you fix her? Uh, you know, do we have to wait 50 years again? Like in Norway, we just got a 50-year one healed. And so how do, you, what do you, how do you not have to wait 50 years? What, what can you do? And I absolutely don't know what to say to you. All I know is I try my best to stay in contract. I try my best to stay looking for those shoes at the feet of Jesus. <clears throat> and we all cried because she's, she's absolutely my friend. She's weird because she's so happy. But now she's not happy. She's broken and, and everybody's sad, right? Because her joy is not there. It's been taken from her. And that's the plan. You hear me? Whether it's religion, whether it's poverty, whether it's sickness, whether it's hate, whether it's envy, it doesn't matter the name of the project. What matters is that it's taken. So how do you restore that? Well, my boss is, this, he, without him, it ain't going to happen. So I lay, I lay on top of this girl in that wheelchair. I'm laying on her. Boom. My wife's standing right there. And she's, she's not like me at all. She's soft touch, don't say much, just do. Me, I'm real emotional all over the place, you know, aggressive. That, that, I got her portion. And so, so, you know, there ain't nothing you can do. So you go ahead and tell me what clinic I can send her to and get her a new back. You go ahead and, you're smart. I know you are. Now, you go ahead and tell me how to fix this. Oh, just pray, brother. For real? You going to give me that religion? <laughs> so, she's broken. We prayed. We love her. It's not that we don't love her. We love her. But it did not do anything. Do you hear me? So how do you get it to work? I know you want to know what a start switch is. So do I. But I'm, I'm not looking for the start switch. I'm looking for the boss. I get the boss, I got the start switch. So we left. We had conference ended. She's still in the wheelchair. Pain. Goodness. So what, so we got done Sunday evening. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this is like four or five days after we did the initial prayer. She's a, now she's this uh, real fancy nurse person, runs the ER in this hospital, and very famous in her world. Uh, so she knows she's done for. She's in the hospital waiting room to get another battery of tests to see if they can up her dosage of pain stuff. Uh, trying to figure it out. And she's sitting in there and the glowing man showed up. So y'all don't even know who he is. But that's who you're under contract with. His name is Jesus. So you don't know the glowing man. I know him. I used to think he was, he was with us. But now, after all these years, I have figured out he manipulates my life and puts me where he wants me because I'm with him. 
Did you hear me? All right. I don't believe that. I know. That's why they call you an unbeliever. <laughs> but I'm a believer. I, I don't give a flip what he manipulates about me and my family and my life as long as I can help Bianca. I don't care what the price is. I don't care who has to pay it. What I care about is Bianca. She needs to be healed. She's a good person. If there is such a thing. She would be the happy version. Well, y'all, all of a sudden, the glowing man, he don't ever say nothing. He just shows up, and she's in a, she's in a hospital. What the? Seems like there was another place he could have gone without. But she's in there dressed like they dress you, and he just walks up to her, glowing man. Didn't say a word, just touched her. Walked up through the roof, goodbye. All of a sudden, she got a brand new back. Okay. All right. That's a little bit much for me. What that does is it's awesome. We got Bianca back. But what that does for me, it creates a whole cluster of new questions. All right. So the other day I was there. They failed to send me an email. The way y'all send emails, there was no failure involved. It was on purpose. So I get there. I drive up. My son's driving the van. I'm sitting there. You know, we pull in, and I look over there. There's Bianca. I go, what? And here she comes. Boom, boom. boom. <laughs> she reaches and gets the door. Brother David pulls me out of his thing, cracks my back, laughing. I said, Bianca, do not put me down. Come on. Shake me, rattle me, hold me all you want to. Girl, how'd you get a new back? She said, I don't know. I was sitting in there and he just came and touched me, and here I am. <laughs> what? I need you to want that. You hear me? <laughs> now, it, it's not your fault or mine if this stuff does happen. But it's his. Look, the torture my wife and I went through a few years, God, I was miserable. But the 50-year lady in Bianca, I didn't pay enough. That's beautiful. And there's a bunch of them. It's just one after the other. So let's stand up and do something else.